And now for um, a different kind of celebration, the work and the life of the artist, Judith Scott, self-taught, regarded by some as the quintessential outsider artist. Her work has gained a cult following and she now numbers among her admirers the likes of Cindy Sherman and David Byrne. For us, Miranda Sawyer went to the Museum of Everything's Freeze Week show to see a truly unique exhibition. We tend to think that art is made by artists. So can something be art if it's made by someone who doesn't call themselves an artist or even know what art is? These are just some of the tricky questions raised when you consider the work of Judith Scott. Judith died in 2005, aged 61, having spent the last 18 years of her life consumed in the making of these strange and powerful objects that you can see around me. But it wasn't only her creations that were extraordinary, her life was too. She was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1943 deaf and with Down syndrome. Her family looked after her until the age of seven, when, on doctor's advice, she was institutionalised. But Judith had a twin sister, who was perfectly healthy. 35 years after Judith was first locked away, her twin Joyce could bear it no longer and decided to get her out. It must have been very difficult to, to have been apart from your twin for so long. It was, it was very, very difficult. We had always um, played in the same space. We slept in the same bed. We did absolutely everything together. So yeah, it was terrible. I mean, I think I know very well how terrible it was for me, and I can't even imagine how terrible for her losing everything, you know? So what was the institution like that she was in? Can you describe it? Yeah, it was a... Uh, very frightening place. It was these big old buildings, uh, something that you would think of in Charles Dickens' story, and uh, very dark, big heavy doors, children kind of bunched together, overheated, sometimes just lying on the floor. It was a, really a warehouse. When she was in the institution, there aren't very many notes about her life there, but I got her records, and one of them is saying, uh, that they were letting some children draw and Judy wanted to draw and they thought she was too retarded and they took the crayons away from her and she left the room crying and so it was just so sad. And what happened when you got her out? She came to live with us in, in Berkeley, California. A friend of mine told me about creative growth in Oakland which is for artists with disabilities. I went there, I fell madly in love with the place. It's you, when you walk through the doors, there's just such a sense of creativity and aliveness and it's just a very joyful place and I thought she has to go here. Creative Growth is a visionary art center in California where people with mental or psychological difficulties are given total artistic freedom. What kind of work did Judith make when she first arrived? For two years, really, she did nothing. And then one day, she picked up, um, these are very early pieces, she picked up these uh, wood pieces and she wrapped them in uh, this, this cord and fiber and fabric and, and formed these first totems. And if you know about childhood development, it's a really important time for language to develop in the second year. You just become more able to speak. And I think she was learning how to speak. You know, she never did have verbal language. And, I think and so she, this became her language, these are our first words? I, I think so. From the day she made the first one until she died 20 plus years later, she did it every day nonstop until sometimes her fingers would bleed. How long would it take something like this then? It depends. A smaller piece like this might take her uh, a few days to a couple of weeks. The very large pieces took sometimes months. Okay, and she would finish it and then what? Well, when she was finished, she would always, she would make this motion like this and she'd push it away. Done. This looks like there's something in here. What's in here? Right, 
Well, Judith's process was really interesting because she would uh, go around the studio and appropriate objects, which is uh, sort of art speak for steal things. So she'd steal <laughs> things and she'd start to bundle them um, into her pieces and wrap them. These x-rays reveal some of the unusual things Judith buried inside her sculptures. There's a few little precious bits. It looks like some beads down there and a little bit of kind of uh, doily type stuff. And that, to be honest, looks like someone's wedding ring, <laughs> just stuck in the middle of it. For people that had lived in institutions, often they want things to be secure and safe and she, they want to protect um, things as well. And I think she's also using it as the idea of womb or something hidden. She creates these spines and these points of tension. So she's really sewing and weaving it together. It's not a simple wrapping motion. And these works, I mean, we have an exhibition here. It's all of her work. It is presented as a work of a proper, in inverted commas, artist. Are these works for sale? Do they have monetary value? What happens to these pieces? We're not selling these pieces right now here in London, but uh, her pieces are for sale or have been for sale. Um, all the artists at Creative Growth, unless they say no, their work goes for sale and the, the sale of the money goes to the artists to support them. This retrospective is part of a major show by the Museum of Everything, a unique venture that aims to bring the work of self-taught artists living on society's fringes to a much wider audience. Contemporary thinking has it that art is only art if it's made by someone who calls himself an artist. This work doesn't do that, does it? It challenges it. It's a very different thing. When we look at it, we know it's art. It seems crazy for me, for any museum or curator to say, actually, no, this, this isn't art because it lacks art historical context. Every artist has a story, but often the story doesn't come first. They don't say drunk janitor Jackson Pollock. They just say, <laughs> you know, Jackson Pollock. Biography is complicated with some of these artists because it's fascinating. Judith's story, story is heartbreaking um, and astonishing. But actually, the best is when you see the work first, don't know the story, and then the layers sort of peel back. I don't care if the art world defines Judith Scott's creations as art or not. I find her pieces compelling and original, and her story incredibly moving, and that's enough for me. And you can catch Judith Scott's pop-up exhibition at the Old Selfridges Hotel until October the 25th.